The ornamental motifs have been badly damaged by the constant humidity of the undergrowth and the battering of the heavy rains. Huge trees have taken root here and there and are now higher than the walls, their gnarled roots interlocked in a tight-knit network. The blocks of sandstone forming the vaults filled the inside of the galleries with an unbelievable chaos. André Malraux, La Voie Royale, 1930. Eroticism in Khmer art is something that is virtually non-existent. Khmer art, while developing from the same concepts as Indian art, was actually much more serene. Avoiding excess in all these areas, there are no exaggerated forms in Khmer art. You have serene, calm, restrained forms. And Khmer art as a whole is a very classical art. Classical in that it combines rigor with tremendous mastery. There is also a certain modesty, in the sense that nude statues simply do not exist in Khmer art. The extraordinary impression of actually witnessing the passage of time can also be felt in the nearby modern town of Siam Reap. The colonial Grand Hotel, built by the French in 1928, has lost much of its former splendor. Peeling wallpaper, a broken down lift with rusty wrought iron gates, power cuts and insects in the bath. All that remains is a feeling of nostalgia, a distant echo of the heydays of the 30s when the well-to-do guests would set out at dawn to visit legendary Angkor Wat. Vandals have long since pillaged everything, stripped everything to the bone. They descended on this capital like worms devouring an abandoned corpse. They took everything, metal paving, precious faience and ceramic tiles inlaid with mosaics and gold, frescoes and manuscripts. The barbarians ravaged the treasures of the palaces, the libraries and the temples and pillaged the bronze lamps where sandalwood burned at night. Great gods of Angkor, your voices tell me that it is the skeleton of an empire that rises up before me. We know things about the way people lived, particularly from what we see in the bas-reliefs. I am thinking especially of the bas-reliefs of the Bayonne. We hope to find out a little more thanks to excavations taking place at the moment in Angkor and which are being organized by different teams. However, we do know that people lived in wooden homes, as they do today. We know that in spite of everything, Khmer society was an agricultural society. Even though Angkor was a town, Khmer society was very much based on village farming in those days. As for the rest, let's wait and see. But I was going to say that all the same, we do have a good idea of what it was like to live in Angkor. Angkor, the biggest archaeological site in the world, rediscovered by the French explorer Henri Mouault in 1860. But it was Louis Delaporte, on a third French expedition, 13 years later, 
who shipped a number of remarkable commerce sculptures back to France. They can still be admired there in the Musée Guimet. The ancient Khmers used the rivers and lakes to transport the blocks of sandstone to the temples, and Delaporte employed the same method to ferry the sculptures to a waiting ship in Phnom Penh. The Delaporte expedition, the second major looting of Angkor since the whole region had been devastated by the Thai army in the 15th century. There are two types of stolen objects. There are stolen objects that are found in museums, and there are those that end up in the homes of private individuals. A stolen sculpture in a museum is highly regrettable, but it is accessible to the public, to the scientist, and is therefore something that can be studied, that is alive. An object that is in the home of a private collector for the enjoyment of a handful of people is truly lost, and that's a terrible shame. In December 1923, André Malraux, accompanied by his young wife, Clara, arrived in Encore. Before leaving Paris, the young avant-garde writer had read with great interest an article published in the journal of the École Française d'Extrême-Orient, which described the magnificent and varied decoration of a recently discovered temple, Bonté Chray, the Citadel of Women. With the help of locals, Malraux's group attacked the ruined temple with hacksaws and managed to remove several blocks of carved yellowish-pink sandstone figures. The Khmer sculptures were transported by boat to the port of Phnom Penh, where the group was stopped by French customs and arrested for illicit trading in antiquities. Malraux was placed under house arrest for six months and later, after an appeal, given a suspended prison sentence. It was in this apartment on the top floor of what was then the Grand Hotel that André Malraux spent his time in Phnom Penh. It was probably here that he wrote part of his novel, La Voix Royale, published by Grasset in 1930. La Voix Royale, a legendary royal way lined with Khmer temples that perhaps once linked Angkor to Ayutthaya, the ancient capital of Thailand. I don't think there were many problems in that the temple was already partially ruined at that time. And it was even as a result of the Malro affair that people then became interested in rebuilding it. The temple of Bontier Shre was rather remote and pretty much in ruins. I shan't go so far as to say that looting was common practice at the time, but it was not far off. It was the end of those collections that were built up through pillaging all over the world. Except in rare cases, the blocks used in the Khmer temples were never huge, but let us say that it was at least one cartload. But I don't think that this posed any particular problems either. Of course, you couldn't carry it all with you personally, but in those days, people traveled with a bigger entourage than they do now. The stolen sandstone female divinities were eventually returned to the restored temple and replaced in their original setting. But precisely which statues were hacked out by Malraux? Today it is advisable to take a military escort to get to Bontier Chray, a good 20 miles from Angkor Vat. The Khmer Rouge still like to ambush tourists on this lonely road. Carved on both sides, the cornerstones depicted two dancers. The motif was sculpted from three superimposed stones. The top one, if pushed hard, would probably fall. How much do you think it's worth? asked Perkin. The two dancers? Yes. Difficult to say. In any case, more than 500,000 francs. The top of the hair was sectioned from the head. 
In other words, the edge of the block was about here. The head was in two parts, which is why this one is probably Marot's. The question is, where does the block end? If the block ends here, they could have removed it easily. I'm not absolutely sure it's this statue. It's partly due to my ignorance and my lack of memory, and the information I have is second-hand. However, there are two details that remind me of this particular block. First of all, it's a cornerstone, and furthermore, there's the fact that the join was at the level of the hair. And I would think that it's this one rather than the other, because it was already better preserved at the time. The block Marot didn't take seems to have been vandalized. There was an attempt to steal it not so long ago, because you can clearly see it's been attacked with a hacksaw, which also shows that there was a time not so long ago when people tried to steal just about anything. Other than that, it was obviously a beautiful piece. He didn't have bad taste. The École Française d'Extrême-Orient, the archaeological arm of the colonial power, took a particular interest in Angkor and established itself there at the beginning of the 20th century. For more than 70 years, French curators, directors and restorers continued to arrive and reign over the Versailles of the Khmer. A thousand Cambodian workmen, 19 cranes, a giant saw so big it needed its own railway. Until the civil war in the 70s, no effort was spared to completely or partially restore the Khmer temples and statues of Angkor. The thinking behind restoration changes from one period to another. Currently, there's a trend to restore less than before. In 20 years' time, that may change again. There are also different approaches. You can either be content to restore what has survived, or you can try and reconstruct the whole thing as it was. These are the choices that have to be made. Currently, there's a more cautious approach to restoration. The fetidness reminded him that in Phnom Penh, at the center of a circle of wretches, he had come across a blind man chanting the Ramayana, accompanying himself on a makeshift guitar. Disintegrating Cambodia was bound up with this old man, whose heroic poem troubled no one but a circle of beggars and servant girls. A possessed land, a homeland where the hymns, like the temples, were in ruins a desolate land for the desolate. It's hard to imagine that this site, which is now a fairly peaceful spot, was actually a place where recently, about 20 years ago, there was severe fighting and also where the population suffered a very traumatic experience. So it is true that sometimes horror finds itself side by side with the sublimely beautiful. And this strange juxtaposition is sometimes very moving. Landmines and looting, the sinister legacy of both civil war and the war between Cambodia and Vietnam. The Cofras, Compagnie Française d'Assistance Spécialisée, has been systematically clearing Angkor of mines for many years, and today the site is as safe as the English countryside. But what about the hundreds of other Cambodian temples? Every morning, a handful of young Cambodian soldiers of the Cofras set out from the town of Siam Reap to demine remote temples like Trao Shre Vibol, a good 50 miles from Angkor Wat. The 
Their main strength, I think, is their resistance to the climate and to exhaustion, which in this difficult climate always astonishes Europeans. They are absolutely capable of coping with the physical and psychological efforts that clearing minds demands. When I left the army, I was unemployed. I learnt how to defuse landmines because I had no other serious options. This abandoned temple is part of the Khmer heritage and can also become a tourist attraction for the country. That is another reason why it has to be cleared of mines and restored. For them, our presence is reassuring because the European brother is always there and he has a little more experience of these things. The day the Cambodians had to hold a mine in their own hands and start learning how to deactivate it, it's only natural that there was some apprehension. It went very well. Today, that apprehension has gone and they do it with the utmost confidence and quite calmly. Clearing mines is hard work, and you come across all sorts of unforeseen difficulties. The risks are obvious, and you have to follow the ground rules that are taught in the mine disposal classes as closely as possible. I think these lessons should be applied meticulously to avoid causing accidents. Psychologically, the training is also useful because it stops me being afraid. It even gives me a feeling of security at the precise moment I have to defuse the mine. At that point, you need total concentration. You must never allow yourself to be distracted. This young girl, Chan Sakan, lost a leg and was badly burned when she stepped on a landmine concealed in the vegetation covering Chao Shri Vibol. A year after the accident, she revisits her village school for the first time and hands out masks which she hopes will alert her friends to the hidden danger. The paper tigers, elephants and monkeys bear the slogans, I'm afraid of mines, stop using landmines, or mines kill our children. The Cambodians who were left in the country sometimes felt the temptation to mine their own property to protect themselves. To stop this, the entire population that fled because of the fighting must return. They need wells, they need schools, they need dispensaries, roads and bridges. That is the only way people can live peacefully and hopefully stop planting the mines. Each member of the mine disposal unit earns between 80 and $150 a month, a fortune compared to the rest of Cambodia's working population. The money soon disappears during a night at Siem Reap's Sky Palace, a sort of far west Cambodian dance hall, where everyone is searched at the door for explosives before being allowed to choose their partner for the Ramvong.
until now, there was always a huge trade in Khmer art, because Khmer art has always been much sought after. It has an image, an aura, almost a romanticism attached to it that is very important. And it was free. Anybody could do anything. People came, they plundered, they removed, nobody asked any questions. Today, in becoming part of international society and accepting the international rules of play, Cambodia reaps the benefit of international protection, which is obviously an advantage. King Norodom Sihanouk wrote in 1991, thieving in Angkor has become endemic. The work by bandits, theft by traffickers of archaeological objects and deterioration caused by vandals have become commonplace. With financial and material assistance from France and UNESCO, the king set up a special heritage police, a semi-military force of 500 men. Chair Sofat, reputed to be one of the most honest men in the kingdom, was appointed commissaire principal. There are a lot of temples in this region, 37 on the Angkor site and 275 in the whole province of Siem Reap. There are so many monuments that in order to guarantee their safety effectively, the heritage police needs the material support of the royal government. Don't forget that the temples of Angkor and of the whole of Cambodia are our ancestors' legacy and constitute one of the wonders of the world. Here are a few examples of the work carried out by our police officers that will discourage future thefts. During the night of the 23rd of June 1994, they caught robbers stealing this big sandstone Nagra statue from the temple of Vimyan Akas. It was recovered and returned to the temple. Between 1994 and 1995, the heritage police were very active. They identified 162 cases of theft. Each time the statues were recovered, returned to the temple, and the thieves arrested. The looters always have substantial resources. They often operate at night, in small armed bands of five to six people. Once removed from the temple, the goods are transported by car or truck. Most of the stolen statues are then taken to the Thai frontier. And the Thai dealers or go-betweens cross the border to negotiate with the thieves. I consider these people as traitors to their country, devoid of any national consciousness. For sordid financial reasons, driven by their greed, these traitors use the poor and armed men to pillage our heritage. Supposing a farmer finds a Khmer statue in his field, what is he going to do? If he's honest, he'll hand it over to the police, who will sell it at once, instead of giving it to the authorities. Later, the farmer will see that the police officer has bought a new moped or a Mercedes, and he'll have been made a fool of. So it's quite a problem. And when you find something buried in your field, you feel entitled to get something out of it. In Siem Reap, the heritage police provide protection for the whole of Angkor. For the Cambodian gendarmerie, it's slightly different. Our first duty is to ensure civilian security, but we also help safeguard our heritage. Our method for stopping thieves is to go and look for them around the remoter monuments.
But we can't arrest them on the spot, as that is where the Khmer Rouge and the military have their strongholds, and that makes life difficult. So the gendarmes follow the looters and wait until they leave the temples to arrest them later on the road and prevent them from leaving the country. Sadly, there are many thefts in Cambodia organized by big companies like demolition companies, which cannot be financed by antique dealers or collectors. They must be subsidized by the military or by very powerful businessmen. I think the Cambodian government is doing all it can. The king has done all he can to protect his heritage. Unfortunately, all these people who express concern do not have the support of a certain section of the population which is determined to get rich at any price. What we can say is that now the main temples of Angkor, more generally the whole of the archaeological site of Angkor, covering about 500 square kilometers, are protected. The number of illegal excavations and cases of looting have been drastically reduced. But pillaging is still going on in Cambodia. It has simply moved to the north of Angkor and to the provinces in the north of the country in general. On this road, the road number six, leading directly from Siem Reap to the Thai border, there are three checkpoints manned by the Cambodian gendarmerie. On the 31st of January 1997, the middle checkpoint pulled over an army truck, despite the fact that the soldiers produced a pass signed by their military commander. The soldiers threatened the gendarme with machine guns, and when that got them nowhere, they tried bribery. Eventually, the truck was searched and found to contain, wrapped in straw, 10 tons of stolen 12th century apsaras coming from a remote temple, Kokare, in northern Cambodia. This was a major coup for the gendarmerie the first irrefutable evidence that the military are directly involved in the pillaging and transport of Khmer art on a massive scale. The gendarme who gave the orders has since received death threats. For security reasons, he does not wish to be named. There's a whole technique for transporting stolen sculptures. These objects can't be simply wrapped up and carried as though they were small items of jewellery. First of all, the sculptures weigh tons, so they need big trucks to transport them, and that's not a particularly discreet operation. Then they need manpower, at least 20 people, and lifting gear to move them about. Of course the thieves were soldiers. The proof is the photo of their truck and its army registration number. And they had a pass signed by their superior officer. Anyway, they can't be civilians. The people don't have automatic rifles like these criminals. The Cambodian army, seen here protecting Prince Ranari during a political rally of the royalist Funchenpeg party, lack neither the equipment nor the resources to root out and eradicate temple looting. Unfortunately, the military itself is frequently accused of collaborating with thieves and Thai antique dealers. Khan Savuen, for example, the military commander of Cambodia's fourth region, was personally accused by the Phnom Penh Post of masterminding the Koh Kher operation. Predictably, he strongly denies these charges. He claims to have signed the pass and to have planted four of his own men on the truck to act as informers in order to find out who was financing the operation. The people who spread that rumor are probably the ones behind the theft. To be honest, if I had been angry, I would have killed them instantly. But as a Khmer leader, I do not lose, I will not lose my self-control. It doesn't matter what people say about me or whether they accuse me. 
What journalists write about me is irrelevant. I believe in what I do, and also that goodness will be rewarded. What is certain is that when I was at the front, I killed quite a few people who made a living from this shameful traffic. <laughs> When the men on the truck were arrested, I carefully explained to them that they must never steal again. I also asked for the looted objects to be taken to the depot and for legal proceedings to be dropped. But having said that, I'm now being accused of being an accomplice because I allowed the looters to go free. I am absolutely not involved. If I had wanted to kill these criminals, I could easily have done so. But they are only petty thieves. So it wasn't worth it. If I had to kill someone, it would be the people behind the theft, the ringleaders. After the theft and the arrest of the men, I asked for all the statues to be brought to my house. It was to protect them before they could later be handed over to the archaeological depot. It was already dark when they arrived at my home. The next morning, I immediately asked the curator to come and record the presence of these statues and to remove them. Keeping them at my house any longer would have meant taking unnecessary risks. Someone could have substituted them, damaged them even more, or stolen them again. I don't think the military are the only culprits. There are definitely other international partners involved. The military are not alone in Cambodia, and Cambodia is not alone in this illicit trade. It's going on at international levels. France is involved as a major center for Khmer art. America is also involved. It has a huge market. Other countries are involved because they are buyers. Bangkok is less than an hour's flight from Phnom Penh and there is considerable traffic between the two cities. Almost 100% of the stolen fragments of Khmer temples will initially be sold in the Thai capital. After reaching the outskirts of the city, the Apsara will probably take an absurd amount of time to reach the center, despite encouragement from the dancing policemen. The sculpture, especially if it is of high quality, may then have an overnight stay at the Oriental, an oasis of calm amid the noise and pollution of Bangkok, and once home to writers such as Joseph Kessel, Somerset Maugham and Romain Gary. Finally, the orphaned statue will travel by boat upstream from the Oriental to its next destination, one of the many expensive antique shops that thrive inside the rather kitsch River City. Firstly, there have always been Khmer pieces, or pieces supposedly of Cambodian origin for sale in Bangkok. There's nothing new in that. Secondly, don't forget that Thailand has a vast number of Khmer art sites. The entire northeastern province, which they call the Isan, is in fact a former Khmer province. And culturally, it still is. Then there's the fact that the art market is very active in Bangkok, and so is the market for fakes. Thank you.
Only one antique dealer at the River City Mall agreed to be interviewed in front of the camera. The others either called the police or requested politely but firmly that we leave the premises. Suk Sivakua of Friday Antiques is a third generation specialist in Khmer art, but his words should be treated with caution. It's difficult, even for experts, to distinguish between genuine Khmer statues and those that are fakes. Today, objets d'art, and especially Khmer statues, are much sought after. The art market always behaves in the same way, whether it is Chinese porcelain, Thai Buddhas, or Khmer sculptures, you will always find fakes. As soon as a particular sector of the market is buoyant, the fake pieces emerge. It's the same with clothes. Take, for example, Lacoste shirts, Chanel handbags, or Vuitton suitcases. They look as authentic as the originals. That's the way it is. You can't do anything about it. There are pieces that are absolutely authentic, there are pieces that have been reworked, and there are those that are complete fakes. I'd say that around 80% are complete fakes, 5 to 10% are reworked, and the rest are authentic. It's so sad because you see fragments of lintels, fragments of temple architecture, which often have no commercial value. They are like abandoned children. When my father bought an antique, he would tell me and my brothers and sisters to gather round and watch carefully. He always asked, is this sculpture a fake or is it genuine? Is it false or is it authentic? Watch, listen to me and remember. Then if the item in question was a fake, our father would explain how he could tell. Often the style, the date and the patina didn't match. There was a discrepancy. Fakes are often exaggerated. They emphasize the expression, and that is how you can tell. The bodies are too voluptuous, the women's breasts too realistic, the hips too pronounced. Everything is overdone to make the sculptures more attractive. Don't forget that Khmer art is a religious art. It must contain a certain hidden quality. A head, for example, must show a smile, but only a half smile. A full one would be vulgar. In fact, it is perhaps an object, a sculpture, whose beauty isn't immediately evident. As a general rule, Khmer art which dates from an early period fetches a higher price than anything more recent. But the real price depends also on such factors as beauty, rarity and condition. For example, a statue dating from the 6th century and in bad condition 
would make less than a perfect one from the 13th century. In short, you must take into account a number of criteria to calculate the correct figure. Torso of Vishnu, early 12th century, asking price, $15,000. Two layers of four-headed Brahmin divinities, 12th century, $20,000. Probably a 10th century head removed from the statue of a guardian god, asking price $15,000. Head removed from a statue of Vishnu, mid 10th century. The price would normally be $20,000, but because of the nose, it's only $15,000. Head and torso of Shiva, 9th century, Asking price, $16,000. A standing mitred statue of Vishnu, allegedly dating back to the 6th century. Asking price, not less than $150,000. Thailand has a law protecting its national cultural heritage. However, it doesn't have laws protecting the heritage of neighboring countries or, at an international level, the export and import of foreign antiquities. Despite this legal vacuum, the Thai Fine Arts Department intervened on several occasions to stop smugglers or dealers and took them to court. The trials took place, but each time the Fine Arts Department's case was thrown out because of loopholes in the law. Thailand has still not signed the UNESCO Convention of 1970, which prohibits the illegal import of works exhibited in museums or belonging to private collections. Buying a Khmer statue today in Bangkok is a risky business. How can you be certain of its authenticity or prove it has not been stolen? And even if you do get it back home, there is no guarantee that Cambodia will not reclaim it at a later date. You're safer buying from a reputable antique dealer. In Bangkok, the honest dealers always cooperate with the authorities. When stolen items come on the market, the antique shops act as the eyes and ears of the Thai police. What is more, the Department of Fine Arts also takes precautions. It often circulates a list of stolen objects with photos. Recently, the Thai authorities have become more cautious. They're beginning to seize items that have come from Cambodia, which they didn't do before. A few years ago, it was very simple. In Bangkok, any Khmer piece was said to have come from Cambodia, because that way it hadn't been stolen in Thailand, and so it was almost legal. Having said that, I myself wouldn't risk buying Khmer art in Bangkok. In Siem Reap is the Depot de la Conservation, Encore's archaeological backyard. It is a town within a town, complete with houses, streets, and a curator who keeps a careful check on everyone who enters and leaves, especially television crews. Bombed during the war against Vietnam, the depot houses thousands of Khmer chefs d'oeuvre. This sanctuary has gradually come to resemble a military camp. For two years now, Bruno Dajons and his assistant have worked on a computerized inventory of the entire collection. Each item must first of all be briefly defined, identified by name, so you know exactly what you're dealing with. Then you have to measure it, give it size. After that, you must give a clear indication of the nature of the stone and its condition, for pieces can often be identified from the breaks, the fragments, the marks, etc. And then you have to give as detailed a description as possible. All this is entered into a computerized database so that searches can be rapidly carried out according to different criteria. 
An archaeological depot is unique because you can find here both ordinary pieces as well as splendid sculptures, both complete items and tiny fragments. Sometimes we even log a shapeless block of stone. Buddha sur Naga, provenance, Angkorvat, Angkorvat, date donc début douzième. From the start, we decided to have three Cambodian students who will, it is hoped, in the future take charge of the national collections. In other words, the Angkor Depot, which is the largest collection of Khmer statues, at least in quantity, the National Museum of Phnom Penh and the Museum of Batambang. This is the goal we are working towards, with the emphasis on training. So we do a lot of work on statue analysis techniques and the vocabulary. Protection against theft is another very important aspect of our work. From the moment we manage to list and analyze each type of item and to photograph them, we have a photographer who takes three or four shots of each sculpture, we will be able to have a scientific catalogue of all these pieces. The precise description together with the photos is a way, and probably the best way, of protecting the entire collection. The value of this inventory is that it has made it possible to publish a catalogue, this book here, published by the ICOM, the International Council of Museums. It's called 100 Missing Objects, Looting in Angkor. The pieces featured are selected from the four or five hundred that have been stolen from the depot. The message it conveyed is that not only were these statues stolen and ought to be returned, but that also a mechanism had been set in motion which from now on will increasingly safeguard and protect the Cambodian heritage at an international level. This catalogue is a first, and I haven't given up hope of seeing two or three thousand pieces of stolen Khmer art on the internet in the coming weeks or months. One of the pieces stolen from the Angkor Depot was found at the Metropolitan Museum, and two more were discovered at the house of major art dealers. Nowadays, it would not be possible for such a sensational theft to take place, but the sculptures that were stolen between 1975 and 80 from the depot could be anywhere by now. The Khmer god kings would have a fit if they knew what Cambodia has in store for Disney Encore in the year 2000. Sans Illumia at Angkor Wat with special music composed by Jean-Michel Jarre. One million visitors whisked around the temples in air-conditioned tourist buses and five-star hotels to be built at the very heart of this World Heritage Site. There are even plans to renovate the dilapidated Grand Hotel at Siam Reap with reinforced concrete and multiple swimming pools. Modern architects and landscape designers will no doubt erase whatever charm and nostalgia remain from the 30s. However, in July 97, civil war again broke out and rival military factions defending the two prime ministers fought with tanks and rockets in the streets of Phnom Penh. As a result, the ambitious plans for Angkor have been shelved or abandoned altogether. Cambodia, a possessed land where the hymns like the temples are in ruins, a desolate land for the desolate.